Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It is October 6 in Southeast Asia and October 5 in the United States of America, 2022. And today we are speaking with Dr. Kevin Woods, Fellow at the East West Centre and Adjunct Associate Professor at the Department of Geography and Environment at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Kevin finished his PhD in Environmental Science policy and management in 2017, and coined the phrase ceasefire capitalism, which has become one of the most cited terms in the English language scholarship on Myanmar since then. Uh, Hello, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited uh, to speak with everyone today. Our absolute pleasure. Um, let's let's start by talking about, about you and uh, your career, um, your research and activism. How did you first come to Southeast Asia and what brought you to completing a PhD on uh, the political ecology of violence in Burma? Right. Um, it was not a direct route, which are my, uh, you know, some of the best paths to take. Uh, I landed in Chiang Mai right out of undergrad on a Fulbright scholarship to do forest restoration research following uh, a bit uh, too directly my last name, apparently. Um, I was a forester and that's what I was doing, except Within three years, I got really frustrated that I could not understand kind of the political, social and other, you know, political economy forces that were all impinging upon forestry in the in the uplands. And I got really frustrated by that because I didn't have the kind of intellectual training to understand these issues. So I ended up then going back to school and doing a master's degree in Social, it was called social ecology. You could call it political ecology. And, you know, there was no going back for the good and the bad after that. You know, my, my mind was just um, exploded with all of these new understandings because I was such a natural scientist in my undergrad. I, I really just took natural science courses. I ended up doing my master's thesis at Yale with uh, Michael Dove and, and James Scott, among a few others, on looking at the cross-border timber trade between China and Myanmar um, and, and kind of thinking about the political economy of, of violence and conflict embedded in, in that supply chain. And, you know, I, I really think I've been doing that exact same work since then. And that started in 2002. So here we are 20 years later. I am both really proud of that, that I'm still studying more or less the same thing. And I'm also slightly embarrassed um, um, that I have still study the same geographies, the same sort of issues. But um, I think as we'll get on with the interview today, hopefully the audience will realize that I, I'm not stuck in one topic, that I, I have tried to um, increase the breadth of, of what I study and the theories that I'm engaging in and, and um, the ways that it matters to different people. So yeah, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. And how have you... Um... How, how has the tension between do, doing activism and, and doing scholarship played out in, in your career? Because, you know, there are huge, really important environmental and human issues um, in your research. Uh, how do you balance that? And um, how has it, yeah, how has it sort of played out the tension between activism and research? Tension is the right word. Um, I think what I want to say on this is that academics complain about me being too activist oriented and too engaged. That's what many professors in my life have thought about my work and and it's been problematic in my academic training, so I've been told. And oftentimes activists don't like about how academic I am. And so it's, and the same in my writing, Um, academics oftentimes complain that I write too much like an NGO report and NGO people complain that I write too much like an academic. So it's, I feel like I can never win on that. Although I do feel that I've refined those skill sets a bit more over the years, but it, it's been really frustrating. And I often say I would never advise someone to necessarily take this path of trying, trying to bridge these two rather disparate worlds because I believe in it so much. The thing that motivates me most is not contributing or engaging in social theory as much as my geeky inner self would love, loves to do that with colleagues. But my real motivation comes on using 
using what we've learned from social theories and applying that to try to create a more just and equitable world for very marginalized populations who are, you know, after 20 years, you know, it's, it starts to become a part of your personal life and, you know, emotions are strong and identities to these landscapes, places, and people is, is um, well established for me. And, and it's been a gift in some ways to have learned what I have learned in my graduate training and in doing my research and trying to apply that, apply being the key word there, apply that to these armed conflict settings and engaging in what most people would consider completely non-academic exercises that take up a lot of my time. But it's the part of my work that I enjoy the most, frankly. Yeah. So the the upland and border areas of Myanmar are notoriously super complex in so many ways, just as the whole of, of Myanmar is. But yeah, it's it's fair to say that a lot of these areas are and have been for a long time plagued by armed conflict and uh, by natural resource exploitation, by turning land into capital, uh, land grabs, um, all, all this kind of thing. And uh, you write that this is rooted in colonial rule in Myanmar and also partly rooted in Cold War, post-Cold War changes. Maybe you could um, give our listeners a bit of an overview about Upland Myanmar as it relates to your concerns. You can focus on your field sites or you can talk more broadly if you like, but let's try and set the scene and maybe end with why has has little changed or has it um, since you started working in this in this space 20 years ago? Luke, you gave me a lot of room to maneuver in there. Um, let's, see, let's see where I go with this. Yeah, some, something that I often write about, but I, I actually find it really challenging and troubling because I also don't want to ossify or further ossify the very categorizations of land, natural resources, and populations that I'm also critiquing. It's a funny dance, I find. And I don't know if I do it well, quite frankly. But the way I see Myanmar, which is a direct colonial legacy that has since subsequently been picked up by the various iterations of ruling governments uh, since, is kind of an upland, lowland dynamic where you have, I mean, in some places I've called it a Burman paddy or pulse state where you have the two main uh, high value crops, um, uh, a wetland rice paddy in the, in the Delta region and then um, pulses in the central dry zone or I should say beans and pulses rather, which is largely exported to India. And these are predominantly cultivated by farmers who identify as Burman or Bama and as Buddhist, um, which is the same ethnic identity and religious identity as the Burmese quote unquote state, um, whether it be the Tapmada or, or the government. This gets into lots of issue, issues um, around the formation of the modern Burmese state that others have written about. I find Mary Callahan's book um, coming from her dissertation um, to be very helpful in this regard in trying to understand the kind of historical formation of uh, the Tatmadaw, for example, among many others that have that have written about, about these issues. Anyway, I, I try to take that and then apply that to the topic and lens of land and natural resource governance and its reform. And the way that this plays out differentially between what we could categorize as the lowland Bama Buddhist state and the upland, let's call it a non-Bama, non-Buddhist uh, population um, is striking. And I think it requires greater analytical attention, in my opinion. So um, I'm recognizing that not, I'm cognizant of the fact that Rakhine and Shan are predominantly Buddhist, but these are generally populations that reside in irrigated uh, lowland 
set permanent settlements that are better connected to state infrastructure usually. Um, so I'm referring more to those populations um, who are not Bama or Shan or Rakhine and generally live in higher elevations. So I've particularly worked with the Kachin, but more recently, well, more recently in the last seven, eight years, uh, the Karen in the Southeast, both in Kiyin or Karen state and Tenintari region. And of course, then this gets even more complicated because there's plenty of Karen who do not live in the uplands <laughs> um, and who are both Buddhist and Christian. And the listeners are probably aware of all of these complications and my simplifying narrative. So this is all to say that I think one way to understand the geography and the topography and the kind of agroecological systems in the country is in some ways through the lens of racial and ethnic identities, as well as political affiliations and religious identities. And I really appreciate other scholars who have looked at these issues from international relations, political science, sociology, anthropology. I'm trying to do that from the field of political geography and environmental studies to kind of explicate how it is that we have seven decades of war in these ethnic territories and how that has continued under various reform iterations since the end of the Cold War as one way to sum up my bigger picture work. And I've done this through looking at how natural resources has become historically embedded within the armed political conflict, by which I mean insurgency and counterinsurgency, since the end of the Cold War in the late 80s going into the early 1990s. That's one period. Um, and that's that was my writing on ceasefire capitalism, um, was looking at like the 90s into the 2000s. My more recent work has been writing about how the reforms since 2011, so that, that decade 2011 to 2021 when the coup happened, how those more market-based um, reforms and opening up big time to foreign investment and what you could call you know, these sweeping neoliberal reforms, quote unquote, that has changed the nature of armed rebellion and the ways in which the military government is trying to end it. And I've done that by looking at the commodification of various agricultural and resource commodities, particularly timber, which, as I said earlier, I've been doing since actually 2002. So that's that's the oldie but goodie that um, I, I <laughs> will never get old for me. Also rubber, which I've written about quite extensively for many, many years. And then corn uh, or maize was one kind of longer term study I did for several years. So I think what I want to do is to, to speak to these two different periods I, I just highlighted. So the first one, um, the 1990s into the 2000s, which is a, a very tumultuous period, but I guess every period has been rather tumultuous in Myanmar. And that, that is a period where, I, um, where my ceasefire, ceasefire capitalism idea came out of, and that was particularly in KIO areas um, after they signed their first ceasefire agreement um, back in February of 1994, which was a, a, a few years later than many other um, ethnic armed organizations or EAOs had signed ceasefires after the kind of the fall of the Communist Party of Burma in, in 89, with the WA leading that and then the Kokong and uh, later the, the, the Kachin, the KAO. And, you know, the the reason why I was interested in timber was because that became a very, very important commodity and resource for the KIO and increasingly for the TEDA in the subsequent years. Um, part of that reason, well, well, it was due to an alignment of many different conditions uh, during those two decades. One is that the KIO lost... Um, a fair amount of their nearly monopolistic control over jade before their ceasefire. But part of the enticement of getting ceasefires with other ethnic armed organizations um, and ethnic leaders who became paramilitary outfits was to 
allocate them or allow them to engage in jade mining. And the KAO increasingly started losing control over that extremely valuable revenue source. And the ceasefire kind of seemed to somewhat nail the coffin shut on that in terms of they they just could not operate in the same way. They lost territorial control. The WAS started getting involved. The Kokong started getting involved in the 2000s. Then crony companies started getting involved in, in Jade. And it, it became a much more complicated and competitive affair. And so, you know, the KAO turned to the resource that they had a plenty in their territory, which was timber. And this happened around the same time that Chinese authorities in mainland China started to increasingly value their remaining forests that had been largely um, depleted um, since their opening in the 80s. And they started to pass increasingly protective measures along with Thailand at a very similar time in the late 1990s going into the early 2000s to protect their forest resources. And so what that did was it sent Thai and Chinese businessmen across the respective borders looking to source timber um, from Thailand within, I should say, KNU, but then also in the late 1990s, DKBA uh, areas in the Southeast. And then uh, for China in along their border, across their border, um, particularly in areas under KIO control, but also obviously um, uh, the WA and Kokong and various other uh, armed organizations. And so suddenly um, by about the early 2000s, you had the you had over a million cubic meters of timber crossing the border every year. It it was insane. I, I can't stress enough of how many trucks of timber were crossing the border every single day. This is when I started doing my research in Burma on both sides of the border. This is when I was more regularly going to this part of Yunnan when it was a bit easier to travel and do things in China. And Global Witness at this time was publishing just absolutely mind-blowing investigative reports that really put it on the map along with um, Yunnanese Chinese colleagues um, doing uh, careful work and and policy recommendations to their own Chinese leaders. And, you know, basically a ton of people are making a ton of money. The Kachin villagers that I were interviewing and Kachin um, activists that were just starting to take root in the early 2000s, um, and kind of these community-based organizations and local NGOs were starting to, to gain speed during the 2000s. They all had this really just brilliant insight into what they were getting from this ceasefire, which is not what we were supposed to be thinking about, quote-unquote, peace, which was that... Um, All they were getting was dirt roads that would wash out the next rainy season and empty promises uh, of development, in this case, electricity or um, roads that they could use year after year in order to have greater mobility and access to more markets. And, you know, I was able to travel quite a bit during that time. And yeah, it was just shocking. Um, It was just huge logging concessions being allocated to both the new class of kind of crony company leaders, um, local Kachin elite leaders that were mostly spun off from the KAO or KIA, and Chinese businessmen who, some of which who also had either some sort of identity card for Burma or kind of were those people who were able to go back and forth and had complex identities. Um, we're making hand over fist. And, you know, basically what I was trying to look at with this idea of ceasefire capitalism is militarization and defeating the Kachin insurgency was far more successful through the ceasefire and the kind of allocation of timber concessions and, and doing timber deals than what the actual military led fighting ever accomplished. Now, this is a little complicated to go through, but essentially it's like the allocation of logging concessions changes the governance and administration of these places. It suddenly becomes under the the domain, and I mean that in both a power sort of way and an administrative sort of way, 
under the military government at that time. That's one way. Um, but also the timber rents were going to various KAO leaders who became more interested in doing business like this than um, committing to the political ideology that their rebel organization espoused to and what the Kachin civilians were holding them accountable to. It also, and this is the part that I think it's the least thought about, but in some ways is equally, if not more important, is like the material transformations that were happening from the raging logging sector had really important political ramifications. By that, I mean that the KAO and other rebel groups um, use forests as a particular ecosystem within which to conduct guerrilla warfare. It is an ecosystem that's very conducive to that type of fighting that gives the full advantage to the ethnic rebel groups rather than the Tatmadaw, who is more apt at fighting in open expansive areas or through more recently aerial bombardment um, where they have they have to see their targets, right? And they also have to um, mobilize large armies and um, equipment. Um, that forest, wild, natural forests, and all of their entanglements, and I mean that discursively and materially, um, disallow um, uh, fighting in a way that the Tatmana excels at and gives all the advantages uh, to rebel armies. And I'm saying this because when you completely log a forest, um, that is no longer an ecosystem that um, guerrilla warfare can take place. This is precisely why the Americans um, sprayed Agent Orange all over parts of Vietnam, right? So there's a long history here of defoliance to fight against insurgents who use those forests to their advantage. So that's those are multiple ways in which forests and logging became intertwined in KAO ceasefire in ways I don't think anyone, including myself, imagined. And how that had real political repercussions in the continued political conflict um, between Kitchen and the ruling government at that time. And I think it's a really nice reminder of how nature or what some of us like to call socio natures um, are a crucial material background within which power violence and politics play out um, and i i think i really want to stress how i i want my work to to really give a strong visual of the importance of the materiality of these landscapes within which these political conflicts take place Okay, that's great that you've focused a bit there on Kachin State. I think that that grounds things and um, leads us to the fact that uh, in 2011, um, the ceasefire broke down. Uh, and we have this new period in Burmese history. Uh, we, it still hasn't, nomenclature has not been decided upon. We'll call it political reform era Myanmar, uh, say the 10 years leading up to the 2021 coup. Um, and that was the period in which you did your doctoral research. Um, how did uh, things change there? How did this situation of of losing, for example, thinking about this political part you brought up at the end of losing the forests and losing the the means to fight uh, the army of the state, as it were, um, how did that lead to actually re-engaging in, in fighting uh, the state? And what... Uh, reforms at the center when um, Myanmar briefly became a kind of darling of uh, Western liberal democracies. Um, how did those how did those reforms affect what was happening in the in the upland areas uh, up until the first February twenty twenty one military coup? Yeah, thanks um, for leading me to the second period that I wanted to talk about. Actually, I, I started my PhD in 2008. I, the ceasefire capitalism article that published in 2011 was the kind of the, the groundwork for what was then going to be my um, dissertation field research moving forward. And then suddenly 2011, 2012 started happening. I 
uh, moved to Yangon in 2012. And, you know, this, <laughs> this suddenly there was no more ceasefire with the KAO. So it was like one of those, oh shit moments. Um, what do I do now? And so I just basically started to spend as much time as possible um, that I could in Miyachina, um, the fr- provincial capital of Kitchen State. And also um, as that became increasingly untenable due to the armed conflict dynamics that um, kind of ebbed and flowed, um, and it just really became challenging to move around uh, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. I started to shift increasingly to Northern Shan State and spending a lot of time in, in Lashio, the biggest city in, in Northern Shan State, um, and, and actually also a bit in Southern Shan State as well for the corn case study. And the issues that were confronting the communities um, that I was speaking with, in this case, Kachin, predominantly still Kachin, shifted away from talking about timber and logging as many of the forests got logged out and um, there was a increasingly implemented policy shift from Beijing um, to stop logging. Uh, There's more and more political pressure to stop that. And suddenly everyone um, was speaking about what is this new sharp fencing material that we're seeing along roads that we've never seen before. And I was like, what are you talking about? We would go out and it was like, oh my gosh, we call that in English barbed wire, which itself has a fascinating history of basically exterminating Native Americans and privatizing land um, in the colonization of uh, the United States, um, pushing into uh, West um, where barbed wire is um, invented apparently in in the Midwest where I'm from. I was told by my friends and colleagues uh, in Kitchen State, uh, you're the researcher, like figure out what is going on with these barbed wire fences. And that took me on a very unexpected journey, I have to say. And so suddenly I switched from studying timber to studying um, the rise of uh, the agribusiness sector under the reforms that got underway under ex-president um, Thein Sein and carried on into Don Sun Suu Kyi's reign um, until the coup. And, and that was with the land reforms. So then I got into the weeds of, of land reforms. Why I was living in the country can get really involved. And it was extremely exhilarating, exciting, and absolutely exhausting times. For those of you listening who were there, we all know how crazy that time was. Um, and it's basically was privatizing land rights for the uh, first time since, since the 60s. And I, I speak... To that, in uh, a, my, my book chapter, I'm going to selfishly plug uh, a new co-edited volume with uh, myself and Phil Hirsch, Mike Dwyer, uh, Natalia Skura on turning land into capital, development and dispossession in the Mekong region, uh, University of Washington Press. Go buy it now. And it, I have a book chapter in there that's looking at how race and ethnic identity play out in land governance reform these different periods. And the 2011 to 2021 period is really important in that you started seeing a lot of both Burman and ethnic land rights activists like get center stage in the struggle over self-determination. And, you know, it was rightly so, I think, to be center stage because it was it was such an important struggle for both material and political battles over the future of Myanmar and what that means for different populations and who will benefit from those reforms. So in the case of ethnic minority, quote unquote, uplanders, they still predominantly rely, although this has become less so over the years, Uh, with the introduction of these markets that I'll speak to, customary land practices and rules and authority figures, um, none of which is recognized uh, under statutory law um, to this day, apart from a clause in the national land use policy passed in 2016, but that was never implemented and um, under the current political context will not be implemented. Um, And so suddenly, basically, you had populations of the uplands who had no statutory land rights and no governing apparatus 
uh, from the government side that was respecting them. And so these quote unquote wastelands or vacant lands um, were having laws passed to allocate them to the private sector to quote unquote develop them. And so these were just outright land grabs that were happening. And, and this is um, this is where activism was very, very strong and vocal against this sort of land reform. I, at the time, was mostly studying rubber and then also a bit later corn and trying to understand kind of the political implications of this beyond just um, the, the activism that I was trying to be an ally uh, for and with. And what my research was showing was that land that was being actively farmed, either Sweden or settled agriculture um, with orchards, for example, were being allocated to businessmen because there was no official land rights recorded in the cadastral maps that the Department of Ag had. The funding and the kind of uh, push behind that in these cases of the North, uh, where I was doing the research, was China's opium crop substitution program that got revamped in 2006 to be implemented by Chinese companies. And so many of the Chinese companies that were involved in logging that I was studying before suddenly started to form alliances to get involved in agribusiness. And this happened at the same time in the late 2000s as the peak of the rubber market price um, that was just booming. Um, and then on top of that, you had these land reforms that were encouraging private land investment and these agribusiness concessions. And so it was just the convergence of all of these forces um, that were paving the way for these very large estates that were um, owned by some of the country's most famous crony uh, capitalists. Um, uh, Uteza, for example, comes to mind. Um as well as paramilitary leaders who were doing business deals with these um, Chinese businessmen from, from Yunnan who were getting subsidies from the Kunming government to um, produce and export agricultural commodities across the border to, quote unquote, um, offer alternative drug substitution livelihoods to poor poppy farmers. Um, now, the drugs part of that, just to be very brief, was um, exasperating the issue, not solving it. Um, they were not hiring, in this case, Kachin farmers uh, to run these plantations. They were just taking their land. And so in many, in some cases, these um, poor farmers uh, went into the mining sector, but some of them went back to growing poppy. And at the same time, we actually saw a spike in poppy production that has been growing ever since. These agribusiness concessions that were being allocated to cronies who were Burman or Sino-Burmese, uh, mostly from Yangon, um, paramilitary leaders who broke off um, either from the KAO or other rebel groups of Shan state, um, were basically becoming the new landed elite in these places along important strategic corridors um, that were tr either trade routes to um, Muse or um, other cross-border checkpoints um, or butted up against rebel territory um, that was like the frontier of where the state meets rebels. And when you start carving out these massive, I mean, some of them were tens of thousands of acres, majority of them 500. Um, this changes the governance and the administration and kind of the political power operating in these spaces, much like in the ways that I talked about the timber concessions previously during the, the ceasefire period. Um, but during this time, you had like a rule of law that was operating in concert that was in favor of uh, the private capitalist class that was emerging um, vis-a-vis poor farmers who had essentially no land rights because they didn't have formal land titles. They didn't often um, practice settled agriculture that could be land titled even if they wanted it to be or they, or uh, if they could somehow access uh, the state apparatus to do that. There was and still is no formal recognition of road rotational Sweden farming that many people were practicing. Um, and so you just started basically to use somewhat James Scottian language, 
of kind of the lowland state coming up into the uplands, uh, overlaying their sort of administrative and governance apparatus from the lowlands um, that I have found as um, as you can see in the in my my various publications was actually more successful at counterinsurgency uh, than during military led offenses um, during earlier periods and it, it's not unlike the ceasefire capitalism period except it becomes a bit different because the political conditions changed um, from ceasefire back to war. And then you had, this is the main thing that changed, in my opinion, is that you had the increasing penetration of these market-based systems that were very much supporting uh, cash crop booms, both by smallholders as well as uh, large-scale production by business leaders. And then a rule of law that was changing to totally benefit large-scale production, uh, large-scale private concessions. That was a totally new dynamic um, than during the ceasefire period of the 1990s and 2000s um, and was far more effective at basically changing territory away from rebels and towards the state. And, and when I say state, I include paramilitaries as, as part of that because they, they, the para element of, uh, of those entities. And, and that proceeded. Um, I, I also studied um, rubber development in the Southeast during this period. And that was mostly, almost predominantly by smallholders. And you somewhat saw a similar pattern. This is not just by big businessmen through large scale estates. You also saw this from smallholders. So I looked at that through smallholder rubber, corn or maize, uh, and various ethnic um, populations in North and Southern Shan State. And, you know, basically you saw a similar pattern, whereas um, you saw the land and livelihoods um, being lost by marginalized ethnic minorities who were very vulnerable to being inserted into these cash crop market booms um, due to rising debt pressures having to sell various assets and eventually their land to either their brokers or fellow villagers who are more well off. And so this gets into questions of increasing uh, uh, class stratification um, and uh, land increasingly be controlled by uh, village elite rather than, you know, national elites. Um, who are oftentimes, again, tied to the state, either families who have family members in the police or uh, school uh, uh, school administrators or have some sort of government jobs or also these these people who are getting more land in these villages um, whose allegiance is more to the state um, than to um, supporting rebel movements. Um, and then you also had migrants moving into these areas. There's a lot of mobility and migration during the 2010s um, that I think should be looked at more. And I say that because when you have an ethnic minority population be displaced by migrants of a different ethnicity and oftentimes a different religion, then you have political um, allegiances shift from being more supportive of rebel governance and shift more towards the state. And, and so all of these things are happening, both material and discursive through the allocation of these large-scale concessions and through farmers engaging in these cash crop booms that, I argue, increasingly shifted the power away from rebels and more towards the military government. Thank you, Kevin. That is an awesome overview of some of your research. And I think it's going to encourage listeners, hopefully, to go and seek out the juicy details in your many publications. Um, I think that I'd like to ask you now something that sort of complicates a little bit the notion of the state, and that's about um, what's happened since. So the military coup in February 2021, we use that now as the end of the period that we just talked about. Uh, obviously, the military in Myanmar was it decided that it was finally dissatisfied with ceding some of the power of the state to civilians to the extent that it wanted it back and launched a full-on coup, um, imprisoning uh, most 
uh, of the incumbent uh, party, the National League for Democracy, and um, so much more. So I wonder, um, what's the upland element to the coup? Uh, we're, we're talking a lot here about relations between uh, lowland state, upland uh, minorities, um, this kind of thing. Uh, a lot of uh, what you talked about during the ceasefire capitalism period was military-led, military regime-led. And then what we're talking about in the last 10 years up to the coup uh, is a bit more complicated. Uh, in terms of um, patronage and, and who benefits and, and that kind of thing. So I guess I, w- I wonder, um, given your expertise and your background in those uh, 20 years leading up to the coup, how did you read that? Have the, has anything changed since the coup as well? Um, of course, people talk about the coup all the time with regards to um, democracy and ideology and, and the nation, those kinds of things. But I'm, I'm curious about, about your take. Uh, thanks, Luke, for that question. Many things have changed, but many things have not changed since the coup. And I get frustrated, and I know m- many of my friends and colleagues do too, on having the coup as the reference point for this systemic change that happened in the country. Um, I'm sorry, but there's been seven decades of war targeting ethnic populations in ethnic states around uh, the periphery of the country. That happened and continues to happen before the coup and after the coup. And I think it's really important to not create such a stark line in the sand as everything has changed now. What has changed is people in Yangon and Mandalay are wonderfully more aware, and this gives me so much hope, of the types of political oppression and military-led violence that these populations have been on the receiving end for so many decades. Um, And this, I think, is no more true than with a lot more awareness about the Rohingya amongst a certain, um, you know, subset of the population, specifically in Yangon. And I I love seeing those solidarities across groups. This is like really something to uh, focus on and applaud and and give more attention to since the coup, right? There are positive things that have have come from this political moment uh, uh, since the coup. And I know that my... Karen and Kachin friends in particular who find themselves continuing to be in a war zone, right? Like, you know, my heart goes out to the Kachin who during the 2010s had to constantly hear about everyone raving about Myanmar as a success story of peace and stability and what a beautiful country it is. I mean, what utter bullshit. Meanwhile, I was up there trying to interview people who were talking about fleeing bombs um, who lost family members, right? Like 125,000 IDPs who can, who who have been barely existing on the China-Burma border during winters where you have lots of snow, right? Like what bullshit to hear about, about this beautiful reform period. And, you know, the, meanwhile, the Karen, you know, the KNU and, and others in the Southeast signed ceasefires and some of them joined the, the multilateral, quote unquote, nationwide ceasefire agreement, even though it was barely uh, nationwide, of course, were then experiencing the spoils of ceasefires that the Kachin experienced during the two decades prior, which is why I shifted my work down to the Southeast to kind of um, see how that that was playing out under a different geography and, and different rebel group and different ethnic and, and cultural identities and, and practices. And so, yes, there's been a coup. Um, Yes, the national political condition is totally changed. Totally agree with that. Things are so intense and my heart goes out to all of the Burmese, both inside the country and outside the country, whose life is unimaginably physically and mentally challenging. Um, For all of those who, us who study uh, Myanmar and Burma, it's just been so so, um, hard to see our friends go through this. But the situation in the armed conflict-affected territories that I've worked in for two decades, I see only a few changes. 
Now, there's a lot more IDPs in these areas. So um, this is especially true in like um, Mutra district with the KNU calls Mutra district in kind of northern Karen state, um, where fighting has been very aggressive since the coup. And, and frankly, it has been since like 2017, 2018, but no one wanted to talk about that because it didn't fit the political narrative at that time. Now it does. It's, you know, it's more politically compatible with the, the discourse during uh, the last two years since the coup. There's so many IDPs that are there that the KNU is trying to provide services to and Karen CBOs. Uh, my heart goes out to them for, for trying to support Karen IDPs, um, same thing in Kitchen State and, and throughout these ethnic territories where villagers are fleeing war. So that has changed, it's gotten way worse. And now you have people from the cities that are fleeing into these areas, um, mirroring the 88 democracy movement and people fleeing from the crackdown. And so quite tragically, we're a bit back to that period. And another awkwardly positive thing that I wanna highlight is the importance of rebel governance and rebel um, support systems in place in areas controlled by EAOs that um, operate as proto-governments, um, KNU being the best but not the only example in this uh, in this regard. This was that this got severely downplayed during the 2010s, and funds were drying up to support these uh, support systems. Uh, or, or third tier governance systems. It can also be called education, health are the two big ones, but with what I work on, land and natural resource um, governance and, and administration, um, these are all the more important today because it's, it's the, the last vanguard where one can work outside the purview and domain of SAC um, or whatever word um, that people want to use these days. Um, it's where you can actually do work. It's at the vanguard of activism and, um, you know, supporting indigenous customary rights and uh, forced ownership. This is really important. And I really want donors to um, step up to the plate and throw their money um, where their uh, political ideology is in supporting the resistance. Um, and supporting the ethnic CBOs that are working in these spaces um, is so important. The last thing I want to say on this is why I realize that a lot of people who are researchers can no longer do the research they once did. Um, interestingly, like I, I basically stopped working in government administrative uh, territories and, and, and domains since about 2015, largely because I gave up hope in having a positive outcome on policy matters at the union level. And instead I started um, spending my time and energy and efforts working in rebel administrative territories and on um, rebel governance and policy support on land and natural resources. And so that, in that regard, my work has only been somewhat disrupted in that way because um, these EEOs um, have rightly so their attention more on the new political situation they're confronted helping idps and dedicating resources to fighting against against the sack but at the same time it's you know it's a fairly similar political governance arrangement the need is even stronger than it was before the coup um, so this is all to say if you are centering the uplands to use uh, that language if you are centering the uplands in the political narrative since the coup. Um, not so much has changed other than an escalation of fighting and more IDPs. And that says something for how bad and horrific the human rights, the environmental injustices, and the, the civil war has been leading up to the coup. Um, and the more people in the rest of the country, in particular in these elite circles of Yangon and Mandalay, realize that, I think the more hope I have for a future democratic Burma that's aligned on equity and justice across these diverse populations and geographies. That's excellent. Very, 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 very good answer. Thank you. Um, one thing that it's made me, me think of uh, when 
um, you talk about these rebel governed areas is that something we haven't mentioned is there's been an acute change in one part of the country, which is that a lot of Sagain region now is under the control of rebels who do not necessarily subscribe to a different identity other than being Burma, um, speak Burma, um, all of that. And, you know, there are, there are reports coming out of there, that, you know, people's defense forces have control of whole, uh, quote unquote, national parks. Um, thousands of elephants are, are under their, um, you know, their jurisdiction or whatever you'd like to call it. And the engagement with these groups is, is really patchy when it comes to outside, outside the country. Uh, they're not seen the same way that these really established ethnic armed organizations are seen. Uh, but they have, they are holding territory. Um, of course, they're vulnerable the same way that many other groups are vulnerable to Myanmar military air, airstrikes and, and incursions. But at the end of the day, they're holding ru- large swathes of, of rural of rural Myanmar. There was recently an article in, in Frontier, Frontier Myanmar, an English language publication about um, elephants that bro- brokers are offering the People's Defense Forces. We'll buy these elephants for you, US $7,000 per elephant to take them to China, where they are likely going to be killed and used for their parts. And that must be tempting for someone who's waging an insurgency against the state and does not have weapons. Um, so are you keeping an eye on, on the development, institutionalization, the chances of these new rebel groups that have cropped up after the coup? And it's an aphorism now, but it's worth mentioning that it appears the Myanmar military has never been so weak. For basically since it instituted military rule, it's never been so weak across the country. Is We don't know that if that's true or not, but it's, it's said more and more by, by analysts. Um, so yeah, so do you have anything to say about these new, um, these, these, the germs of what could be uh, in the future um, larger, more institutionalized sort of um, uh, rebel governed governed areas and their ecologies, um, I guess, in reference to to Sagain region. That's a that's a great question to um, kind of think about the intersection of land, natural resources, and insurgency since the coup in uh, territories not under EAO control. And obviously, as you pointed out, uh, Luke, rightly so, the PDFs in Sagaing is a fascinating case of that. Um, I, I wouldn't personally categorize PDFs as how I am using the term rebel groups, um, which if there's any Burmese um people listening to this podcast, please know that I'm using rebel groups, not in a derogatory way, quite the opposite. Um, I'm using it um, more in an, either a neutral or in a positive light of, uh, you know, an, an armed organization that has a, a strong lefty political ideology uh, to fight for um, the betterment of their people um, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a technical definition, but I, I don't mean to use rebel group in a way that the Minma or insurgent group in a way that the Minma government uses it um, that gets translated more in English as more like terrorist. Anyway, so that aside, the PDFs and the issue of let's call it accountability and transparency how they're managing or not um, the land and natural resources that they now have territorial control over is of keen interest of me and my colleagues. And I have been trying to keep tabs on that as best I can. I think it's really important that the NUG hold those PDF units accountable for the good governance of the population's and land and natural resources within their territorial administration because they are supposed to be under the remit of NUG, right? In that regard, I would advocate for working with NUGs, in this case, uh, MONRAC, the uh, Ministry of Natural Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Conservation, something like this to ensure that there is not basically illegal logging or mineral extraction or in the case that Luke, you said, and I I did actually read that article that recently got published, the selling of elephants 
Um, and you can do that, for example, through remote sensing technologies to some degree and monitoring significant tree cover change that you would see from mining and from logging, for example. And, um, you know, other ways that you can uh, find creative ways to ensure that there's good governance practices being implemented by PDFs and that they don't start turning into some of the same bad practices that villagers have long complained about, committed by paramilitaries, the government, and the military. Oh, you, you just mentioned there, Kevin, something called remote sensing. What, what is what is that? I don't understand what that. I can sort of guess what that is, um, but uh, not 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 coming from the same background as you. Could you talk a bit more about how that's being used in, in Myanmar? Oh, yeah. Great follow-up question, Luke. Thank you. Actually, this is analysis using satellite imagery, a a new methodological approach. And it's been much to my surprise, um, because I was uh, still am uh, somewhat skeptical on the virtues of using satellite imagery to understand the type of questions that I'm asking. But it's been so helpful, right? So remote sensing is basically using satellite imagery to show land use and land cover change. And there's many different types, and I am not an expert at this. I have just been incorporating the analysis provided by remote sensing experts with my field research analysis to come up with kind of new insights. This field of remote sensing, um, NGIS, has, has advanced leaps and bounds in the past five years from what I can tell. Um, in terms of the resolution um, that is publicly available. I mean, you can now have publicly available remotely sensed satellite imagery down to a few meters um, without paying a penny. That is like amazing. There's uh, several satellites that cover the tropics that do not include Myanmar, um, but there's one or two that do. You know, like every week or so, you can now see down to a few tens of meters on um, deforestation hotspot. And even now with uh, NORA, uh, Nor- the Norwegian government has subsidized uh, the planet company's data set on three and a half meter resolution for every place in the tropics. So, so because Norway is now paying for this, it's publicly available and you can use this in Myanmar. It's incredible. Three and a half meters, you can see extreme details and understand the driver of this um, deforestation, whether it be like a new road going in or mining opening up or logging or an agribusiness concession or a new military installation. Um, and it's that data set is updated every month. Um, the 30 meter resolution um, that's provided by what's called the Glad L satellite uh, is, is every eight days. And, you know, since the coup, I feel like this sort of remotely sensed satellite imagery data analysis is all the more helpful, especially in areas that are under siege or are no longer able to access either by people such as myself or our research colleagues or NGOs or CBOs due to um, human security risks. Um, And so I I want to really um, encourage the use of remote sensing technologies and incorporating them into people's existing um, activism work and scholarship to kind of understand a whole range of issues that are happening. This has um, more recently been incorporated by the humanitarian sector because it really helps to look at um, who has been displaced and where these displaced populations are moving because that often involves uh, a change in land cover and land use so it can be detected by satellites. Um, yeah, this is so my work. My I have a paper in Journal of Remote Sensing that looked at annual deforestation rates from 19, no, from 2000 until 2020. And I interpreted the rate and spatial distribution of deforestation in various locales that I looked at through the political and militarization changes that were happening in those locales at that time. And it worked way better than I thought. Um, And it made me realize how we can critically, and that for me is the key word, critically use satellite imagery to scale up in these instances, 
of field research sites and also be able to say a bit more confidently on trends beyond the village level of why we're seeing certain um, land use and land cover changes that I was never able to do by interviews alone at the village level. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I think a lot of people will intuitively understand the opportunities you talk about there because now everybody uses Google Maps and sometimes just for fun, you 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 know, so people understand um, the power of satellite imagery and the detail that you talk about is really, really cool. So I'll get the uh, links from you and I'll, I'll put them in the, the notes to, to this podcast. Yeah, and so that kind of brings us nicely to our penultimate question, which is about what you're doing now. Kevin, what are you working on now? Would you like to speak about that? Yes, I'd love the opportunity to speak to that. Um, it, those of us who do research in Myanmar have really had to find innovative ways to pivot, but also remain embedded and committed to the political struggles and situation in Myanmar. And, um, the way that I've found to do that without being able to go to the country is to try to connect Burmese migrants who are who have long been coming to Thailand to the rural villages from which they left. So this idea was festering in me for many years because I have long been interest, interested in uh, dispossession uh, or even just uh, outright displacement. Um, but the, the thing is, is when you're doing research in a village, the people who were displaced or who sold their land and left, they by that very nature are not there. And I, I never get to interview them. Um, and it's really frustrating because like in some cases, those are the people I want to interview the most. But the only people they are able to interview are those who are kind of like making a go at, you know, the the cash cropping or who are working on these estates, et cetera, et cetera. So great. This is an opportunity then to not find exactly those people in the exact villages that I studied, but in general, Burmese migrants um, who come from the townships that I've studied in Karen State, Tanintri Region, North Shan, and Kachin State, um, who are now migrant workers in Bangkok. And I chose Bangkok uh, not just because there's hundreds of thousands of Burmese migrants there, but because uh, I want to connect this to climate change. And I know that's the new buzzword and blah, blah, blah. But I think there's a certain um, set of just an emergency situation that I think deserves more attention. Bangkok is the second fastest sinking city in the world next to Jakarta. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, Jakarta is moving their capital because of this issue. Um, Bangkok is doing very little to nothing with regards to sinking due to the bedrock, soft bedrock that it's on and to the extremely unsustainable rate of um, extraction of groundwater um, that further accelerates its sinking that it's actually not that far um, from the sea. And so um, as the ocean levels rise and the sinking and climate change impacts with, yes, drought, but also uh, extreme flooding events, you know, we're saying, I'm saying this right now is um, everyone is preparing and uh, for the most catastrophic floods in several years to hit Bangkok uh, as they see what's happening in Chiang Mai uh, right now. Um, what does this mean for the, the millions of Burmese migrants and, and other migrants, uh, including Cambodian, in Bangkok with the acceleration of the impacts of climate change for these very vulnerable populations and the places they live and work? Um, one. And two... I really want to connect their migration to um, the structures and material environments that they fled. Increasingly, the media is referring to migrants the world over as climate refugees. And I think that's really dangerous because of that A, politicizes why people are fleeing and what they're fleeing from. Um, in many cases, migrants would never explain their story of migration from the lens of climate change, apart from some in the Polynesian islands, uh, such as where I'm located. Um, instead, they often explain fleeing war, uh, violent, physical violence, um, 
oftentimes gang related in the case of uh, Central America, Latin America. Um, they're fleeing uh, an agrarian environment that is increasingly degraded environmentally, ecologically. Um, and, you know, youthful aspirations of not being farmers anymore, right? So it's like gender, it's generational, it's environmental, it's political economy. Um, it's that the government, and of course, this is true in Myanmar, the government surprised no support materially or politically to these rural farmers. And so, yeah, they're fleeing uh, for a better future. And how is that going to shape uh, in the in the years and decades to come with an amplifying impacts of, of climate change. So that's my new project. I'm suddenly going to be doing urban political ecology using ethnographic methods in Bangkok. It's very new to look at political ecology of mobility and migration. Um, I'm pairing up with Chula Long Kong University's political science department and their uh, center for uh, social Development and Sustainability Studies, CSDS. Uh, I'm very excited to be working with on this building on their previous work on, on, on this area um, with Burmese graduate students. And so this is a new four-year funded project that I have where it's going to be um, my new research arena. So come and visit me in Bangkok and uh, let's talk story, as we say here in Hawaii. Will do. And I'll, um, I'll bring some Wellington, some gumboots, uh, when I do. Um, that's awesome. That's really fantastic. And uh, it's it's great, isn't it? Wonderful when, when you do research that you can um, still find yourself doing something so completely different that you never expected, even though uh, in social sciences, you often um, study very narrow, narrow topics. Now you're going to find yourself yeah, doing this um, urban uh, research on, on, on climate change. That's, that's fantastic. Um, the last question we always ask people on Myanmar Musings is a light one. And that's just for you to give a recommendation to, to the listeners. Uh, anything to do with Myanmar, it doesn't need to be scholarly. It doesn't need to be a book. Um, it can just be something that you've been thinking about or you've enjoyed um, recently. Maybe you've come across something when you've been uh, researching the Burmese population in Bangkok that you know has piqued your, your interest. Um, before we finish up, uh, do you have a recommendation for our listeners? Um, I love that last question. That's a, a great place to to leave everyone on. Um, I definitely have a recommendation, and it's what has guided my work for 20 years, and it's gotten me into some really <laughs> heated and interesting arguments with, with my, my colleagues, which is that to let the material environments within which we study to guide the research topics, questions, theories specifically for a country like Myanmar, because people are, are so living in their physical environment. I mean, they have no other option, right? Like whether you're a farmer or an urban resident, you are like living in the physical environment. The heat, the lack of electricity, the mold, the dust, all of these things that anyone who's lived or worked there knows exactly what I'm talking about. The, the rural environments and the food and the the, the forests, the, the fields, the, 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 the colors of the crops that are grown in Sean State, I really encourage my listeners to let that guide you rather than fancy theories you read in books. Because that's what matters to the people that you're working with and studying. And therein lies truth. Um, I'm a really big believer in that. And that's why all of my case studies and what I would like to believe are my theoretical contributions come out of those kind of getting my boots dirty with my field researchers and my colleagues and my friends about what it is that's going on and why it matters. And that has also guided my, my scholar activism and how I've gotten involved in a non-academic way. That's where the story is. That's what people are passionate about. Therein lies the important work we need to be doing as academics. And don't forget where social theories come from. It comes from lived experiences and people's lived realities, not from books. So read everything and then, and then get dirty. So thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to get on my soapbox and, and say what I, what I like to say to fellow researchers and colleagues. <laughs> 
No, it's a terrific recommendation. Um, thank you very much. Very clear one as well. Uh, and, and thank you for coming on Myanmar Musings podcast of the Myanmar Research Center. We really appreciate it um, at the MRC. And uh, it's been it's been too long. Uh, the podcast has been going for nearly or well, for over six years now. We haven't had you on, but I, I've always had you in my mind as a as a guest. And I'm so happy that we we made it happen. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you.